Congratulations, guys. We're eight hours down. We're 33% of the way there. Now we're up to session nine. Uh, so this session, uh, from my mind, being presented from Rob Jackson, uh, him and I have been uh, working collaboratively on a couple of small projects together over the last few years. But some of the work that he's been doing in the UK is, is revolutionary. Uh, and the way in which he's been performing information management tasks under ISO 19650 and assisting government agencies and, and, and large asset owners to deliver assets successfully uh, in line with the requirements uh, that the UK government stipulated and mandated from 2015. So today, the presentation you're going to see from Rob is an open BIM case study. And what you're going to see is, is the methodology that that brought all of these different software packages together and and some of the trips and falls and the positives and negatives of the, of this whole approach for many people this approach and this process seems so far away into the future for you but as an architect using archicad now is the time i implore you to take note of this session and realize that as a practice to be relevant in the future you need to be capable of being able to do this and deliver these outcomes. Now, I'll uh, hand, over, hand you over to Rob uh, for uh, session nine. Thanks very much, Rob. Welcome to session nine of Archie Intensive. This presentation is an open BIM case study uh, looking at the research and development project delivered using ISO 19650 for the Department for Education. The project is called Gen Zero and Bon Brian Digital are acting as information managers for this project. So I'm just going to start by giving you a brief overview uh, and explaining the project brief that we received at the beginning of the project. So this is a research and development project looking at the design and affordability of carbon zero schools. It involves the design of two theoretical school designs, one for an urban site and one for a rural site. The project is only working from stages zero to four, so up until technical design and has no intention currently uh, to be built. So it's very much uh, looking at the design phases. There are seven disciplines involved in terms of the modelling side of things uh, uh, and we'll look at those and touch upon those later. And the delivery team is being led by Mark McDonald. Uh, as I mentioned ISO 19650 is a key component of this project and really the project is designed as a vehicle both to look at the, the zero carbon aspects but also to uh, inform the future development of the Department for Education's approach to information management. So when we first started this project, uh, we were given a brief, a written brief, and there were four key themes to this brief, sustainability, standardization of spaces, technology, and design for operations. And there are various components below each of those four themes. And BIM and digital fell below technology, uh, included ISO 1950 compliant process, common data environment, the use of MBS Chorus as a specification platform, uh, and the suggestion in the brief that Autodesk Revit should be used for the model authoring tool. So we took this brief and we analysed this brief and looked at how we could provide value to this process and how we could as information managers contribute to supporting these four themes. And what we came to the conclusion was that we, we needed to re-imagine uh, the brief and look at how we sort of restructure it without necessarily changing the approach fundamentally, but we introduced, uh, took the information management aspect, the ISO 19650 compliance and moved it almost in, in its own section and really uh, to cover really all the four themes that uh, exist within the project. And then we looked at those four themes and started to look at aspects that we could contribute to and, and those are listed here. Uh, some of them moved around from where they were, so the operations and maintenance information was originally under sustainability, but we put that on design for operations. And fundamentally with this approach, we, we wanted to take an open BIM approach. And this is before the designers became involved in the project um, because we didn't want to limit uh, those consultants who ultimately were appointed to deliver this. So I'm just going to go through uh, the five sections now, the, the four themes plus the information management. I'll start with information management. So 
part of the reason we were asked to be involved is because we've been delivering ISO 19650 projects for pretty much since the last time, or sorry, since it came out in uh, December 2018. And so we apply this process to all of our projects and the DFE wanted to uh, apply this to this particular project. So we've tried to stick as, uh, as rigorously to this process as we can. Uh, this diagram is actually available on our blog if, if anyone wants to uh, look at it later. So uh, initially our appointment was directly with the Department for Education helping write their requirements. We had a, a very short commission to do that. And then we were appointed by Mark McDonald as the lead appointed party uh, to deliver the project. Although contractually we are under Mark McDonald, uh, it's fair to say that we have a fairly open relationship in terms of talking to the Department for Education and MOTS. Uh, so it, it's very much a, a three-way conversation. And of course, our, then our relationship with the designers below that and, and the other uh, information authors. In a bit more detail, uh, my role is the information manager on the project and I'm working directly with the DFE's BIM implementation manager, uh, who's specialising in the, the BIM side of things for the DFE, and also uh, the project managers on the, on the project. So we have those kind of two uh, connections, but also directly with the DFE's own project manager and behind them the DFE themselves and some of this process has involved direct conversation with, with their various team members. I'm supported by another colleague who has a specialist uh, interest in delivery of Autodesk Revit um, and together we are working with the designers to deliver this project. So uh, the first thing really was developing the, the exchange information requirements. Now Whilst um, this presentation involves a lot of technology, the technology is really the vehicle for delivering the information. So we came up with this concept uh, a while ago called the Information Hub, and it, it's constantly evolving and developing, and we're seeing how we're testing it on how it works on projects, but all of our projects are kind of delivered like this. And it involves three technology solutions, which I'll sort of briefly explain how this fits into this project. So the first of these is uh, where we document our information management resources. What traditionally would have been Word PDF documents, we have replaced by a cloud-based platform. And this platform is set up to follow the ISO 19650 process. In fact, this screenshot is the latest sort of working version of, of our information hub, and we're almost becoming more uh, faithful to the standard as, as we can. Um, so this, this is actually on a platform called Notion, um, but the platform doesn't really matter. You could use other platforms to do this process. It's more about the thinking that goes behind this. So we built this specific platform for the Gen Zero project. Uh, this was a slightly earlier version that we, we developed and worked up. And it works across um, different platforms, so from desktop to mobile, and also can be saved out as traditional uh, formats such as PDF and this was important even when selecting the platform to consider how uh, these resources as they're known under the ISO rather than documents but can be saved out as traditional documents for including in contract where they need to be so whilst we discourage the use and the saving of PDFs that the platform does support that. So as part of this work we worked with the DFE to develop um, a number of documents and probably these are the four I guess key ones so the project information standard which covers all of the standards from file naming and layering and so on through to the project's information production methods and procedures. So that's about the process that we're actually going to deliver the information. Critically, the EIR, the exchange information requirements, which sets out the detailed requirement of what's required. And then supporting reference information and shared resources. As I said, there are more, more than this, but those are kind of probably the four key ones that, that support this project. Behind that, though, um, what we came to the conclusion over the number of years is that Using Excel, for example, documents is fine, but up to a point, but it, it doesn't give you robust data. So we use a database to sit behind this and part of the date, this database is then embedded within uh, the information hub concept, so within Notion. And this supports uh, the development of the EIR and various other um, resources that we've de delivered for this project. So it's not just one database, it's a series of databases, uh, some of them um, are complex, some of them are fair, you know, fairly simple in, in how they're set up. But the important thing is that most of these databases are built around standards. So whether it's ISO 19650 as a process or in the UK, the particular uh, annex, the national annex, but also IFC ISO 16739 is, is a critical part of what we deliver. This allows us to build these projects, uh, not just for Gen Zero, but ultimately use these for other projects as well. 
So this is just some examples of the database and, and you can see here that this database is set up around uh, the IFC entities and data associated to those. Uh, because it's a database, things can be connected and you can make sure much more uh, rigorously that the data is uh, consistent and uh, of high quality. Behind this are the things like naming conventions. So the naming conventions are all set out for the naming of uh, object types and object occurrences against the IFC schema. And again, all of this is flows through into the actual information delivery, but this is part of the exchange information requirements. Uh, even so further, we go into the detail of documenting these uh, against the IFC standard. So you can see these light blue boxes are actually linked within the database. And again, this gives us the rigidity of what we're producing and make sure that we can ultimately deliver this information through the delivery process. The third component of our information hub uh, currently is a set of process diagrams. This is using a piece of software called Whimsical. As I mentioned before, you could change this for, for another solution, but it's quite a nice cloud-based solution for de developing uh, a number of different diagrams and processes and so on. Uh, and again, this is embedded within uh, our information hub. So that's a little bit about the EIR. Uh, and now to talk about the sort of planning side in terms of delivering that. So part of the, the EIR was to not just document uh, BIM and to document data that was required, but to document all the information that's required for a project. So everything from uh, reports, schedules, certificates, and so on. Now, of course, this project is primarily focused on the first uh, well, stages two, three, and four. Uh, and we went through existing documents, the employer's requirements that exist for the DFE, and transposed those onto the project. Um, interestingly, the project manager did a very similar exercise in parallel to us, and we eventually joined up. And um, it's probably a lesson learned that we probably should have uh, talked a little bit earlier about who was doing this. But you know, as information managers, this is critical to making sure we deliver what, what we need. As part of this process, we developed um, a classification, a bit of a homemade classification. Uh, I won't go into the reasons for that, but we created this classification where every piece of information had uh, a clear um, tag. So in here, 38 1 to 100 floor plans is the, is the critical piece of data here. And then we start to go through the delivery process. So the model authors, or the information authors, I should say, and this isn't just model authors, anybody producing information, will set out their delivery process. And part of that is to classify that information against that exchange information requirement. So here you can see a drop down menu uh, and choosing those values to make sure that the information is reporting against the EIR. Then from there, that uh, task information delivery plan is then uh, put into a cloud-based solution. Again, this is the database that sits behind it, which is Airtable. And you can see here this value, uh, this classification reference is key to uh, documenting what's going to be produced on the project before any information is actually produced. Eventually, this information, this classification is part of um, a site, which is the common data environment for the project. So again, this information uh, is available within the system as metadata. The important part of this is that when you look at the structure of the folders for this, it's very limited. We've only got three folders, documents, drawings, and models, but there's lots of metadata here to search and filter the information. And you can quickly create standard filters. Uh, so here's one for those floor plans, all the floor plans on the project. Uh, and those safe filters can be uh, shared with the team as well. So rather than everybody setting them up, we've agreed consistent uh, filters that we can share uh, between us. It doesn't stop the user creating their own as well, but this, this classification is important or li list as it probably should be called. So for Gen Zero, the process is really the EIR and, and it also includes the responsibilities in this particular case, informs the task information delivery plan, which contributes to the master information delivery plan uh, of everybody's uh, information. And that confirms the information to be uploaded to the common data environment. As I mentioned, we built a bespoke list for this process, and that was largely to do with the fact that the timing of the project, we didn't have the opportunity to go and talk to MBS about how we could add additional classifications that we might need. Moving forwards, we very much see this process being very similar to for lots of projects, um, but probably the, the two main differences, one would be to use UniClass as the classification, uh, and that is the intention, I think, for the DFE moving forwards, but also to ultimately uh, compare information uh, between these different databases, so from the EIR in terms of the requirement, comparing that to the master information delivery, 
delivery plan and then uh, forward onto the common data environment but ultimately as well then comparing the common data environment back to the EIR and while some of these tools do exist and um, this process isn't always efficient and effective currently but that's probably uh, one of the main lessons learned from this process. Uh, another part and again I'm just picking bit, particular bits of this process but the capability and capacity assessments Traditionally, capability and capacity assessments forms are kind of left or the summary is left to the designer or the contractor, whoever's producing the information to kind of give one. But what we wanted to do was create consistency from uh, one, uh, one party to another completing these. So we came up with a series of questions and this form was issued at the tender stage as a cloud-based uh, form that each um, prospective uh, lead appointed party um, needed to submit, a prospective appointed party and they would fill these forms in. This then populates a uh, schedule of values, and you can see here some of the values that get populated in this process. But this can then be turned into uh, an actual form, uh, and these can be saved as PDFs. And you know we encourage the designers here to fill these in uh, truthfully, so we didn't actually score this. We scored them in terms of submitting them, but that was it. Uh, and we wanted to understand whether they're, what their capabilities were, good, bad or indifferent. And we actually said we'd rather you answered honestly than just answer yes to everything. So it was really a good opportunity to find out where we needed to plug gaps in this process. And those forms are loaded back into uh, Notion as PDFs, as records, so uh, the client or anyone else can go and get those and, uh, and check them. And with this data, we can also visualize some of this data. And this is fairly simple and to some degree crude process, but it kind of gives you a visual uh, understanding across the whole team of uh, where some of those gaps are. So, you know, obviously all the green ones, positive yes, and some of the red ones we need to go and investigate and perhaps support uh, those designers through the project. And again, this information is embedded directly back within the information hub uh, concept. Uh, moving on to the second component of the brief, which is around technology, I kind of some of these things might overlap with some of what I've talked about before. I start with the common data environment. So, uh, I guess as a, an information manager, probably our preferred solution is ASight. And on this particular project, the DFE had procured ASight just purely for the project to uh, test this. And we kind of had learned lessons from previous projects with the likes of the University of Cambridge, and we applied some of that uh, application right at the beginning of the project and worked with the DFE, Mark McDonald and ASITE to set this process up. A lot of this relies on metadata. Um, the beauty of that is it largely um, prevents authors from putting in incorrect values uh, and provides a really robust process. And as I mentioned before, it's a very simple folder structure um, set up for this project. All of this, of course, aligns with the ISO 19650 process. Now, because this is only a design-led project, some of the workflows in this were fairly simple and we didn't want to make them complex. We wanted to make the process work for the project. So we, we set about with ASITE uh, and the DFE and, and MOTS working through this process and, and keeping this as simple as we could in order to allow the designers to share information and not be stuck in workflows. And that was important. So um, this has been pretty effective in terms of how, how it's worked for the projects. Um, models, of course, is, is an important part of this process, and this is just the quick screenshot of the two federated models, so one for the rural site and one for the urban site, um, and these are constantly evolving at the moment. Of course, visualisation is an important part of those models, and the architects Lyle, Bills and Young have been producing um, you know, high-quality renders as part of this design process to inform and discuss with the client. Um, equally, you know, taking cuts of the model and, and displaying that and sharing that information. And that's great, you know, it supports the project, it's part of the project, it's part of the design process. Um, equally though, we kind of wanted to look at other technology and other, you know, the information and the data within the models as the real key vehicle. Uh, and we discussed with 3D Repo about putting a license in for, for these projects. And um, this is a cloud-based model viewer that supports uh, the project and allows those models to be uh, visualized in the cloud as and when people need to see them. Uh, again, those models are embedded directly within the information hub, so you don't actually have to leave the information hub to go and look at those models. You need to log in, but you can see both buildings within the system uh, and navigate those accordingly. But um, when we first started this project, as I mentioned right at the beginning, um, the DFE had kind of uh, written a very quick brief and kind of suggested that I guess probably for simplicity for the project that all of the 
models would be built in lots of less Revit. Um, fairly logical, I suppose, in terms of keeping it simple. Um, but also at the same time, you know, it's important that we get the right designers and the right um, people on this project to support this project. So what we actually ended up with was uh, four authoring tools. So we have Archicad, um, obviously as part of this conference, so Archicad is an important part. But alongside that, we have Revit, uh, Bentley Open Building Designer and Vectorworks, um, at Nemechek Vectorworks as well. So we've got a series of tools here. And so I guess previously, probably the perception was that Revit would be the native format shared between designers. Uh, because we've got a variety of tools, IFC becomes the, the standard for sharing uh, as a, in an open methodology between those tools. And of course, the authoring tools themselves are part of a much wider process. And um, this diagram's probably um, looks quite complicated, but in reality, it's fairly simple. There's a fair bit of upload and download in various places at the moment, and in future, I'm sure this will become a lot more connected. But um, what we have managed to do is use the open standards as a way of connecting these tools, and I'll touch on some of these um, going through the rest of the presentation. What's important, though, with our IFC approach, and again, not just for Gen Zero, but for all our projects, is to make sure that the structure of the models, and that's not just geometry, but the structure of the models and the data is consistent across all of these models. So we don't just want data dumped in a model and then have to go off and find it and map it and look for it. We, we need this data to be consistent. And of course, the EIR is critical to this process. But whatever the tool, um, what we're trying to do here is deliver a consistent output from each of those uh, pieces of software. So as an example of this, um, the EIR or the, the information hub sets out the site name for the project, which in this case is rural, fairly simple. Uh, and we've delivered that piece of data across all of those seven discipline models on both projects, so 14 uh, models, and making sure this data is consistent. That's one very simple example, but of course we're trying to make this at every level of the IFC model will be consistent and, and make sure that we ultimately deliver um, what we've set out in the information hub. Of course, we're dealing with lots and lots of data and lots of it is complex and we need to look through the model and try and assess uh, this information and, and make sure that we're delivering uh, what we set out to deliver. So schedules have been a, a real key part of this process. And again, you can see here various models delivering the data in consistent uh, ways. So nomenclature is important. Uh, new classification, both uniclass and NRM is an important part of this process and making sure these models are as robust as we possibly can make them. But alongside kind of looking through schedules, there are automated rules as well. Uh, some of these come from a, a big library of rules that we've built. I think we have almost about 20,000 rules now, but then we've supplemented these with client specific rules. So these client specific rules are built from the EIR uh, and you can see here there's quite a lot of rules built around the building. So Traditionally, building information is fairly limited, but we were trying to look at in the EIR and look at um, what value we could provide in, in putting some of this data in the model. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. But this is checking data exists. It's checking it's from value lists. And we still do manual checks on top of this to make sure that we're delivering what the EIR set out to deliver. Another requirement of the project uh, set out early on was the use of MBS Chorus as a specification tool. Now, through this process, we became, we looked at the process and originally, I guess, on the left hand side is what we, uh, I guess, what the DFE and to some degree ourselves probably imagined is that the individual models would link to Chorus and also the federated models would link to a single Chorus account. What we've actually ended up in reality is with a series of Chorus accounts um, because they're kind of company accounts and currently MBS don't offer a, a project license of, um, of Chorus, which desperately I think would be a, an improvement on what they can offer. Um, so it, there are individuals, and it's not the end of the world, you can still go and find the specification. But we also talked to some of the consultants who felt that Chorus perhaps wasn't uh, either uh, cost effective for what they do or didn't deliver um, the information that they wanted to set out. In some cases, like for example, catering has a fairly simple requirement to, to deliver this. So we actually built a solution directly within our information hub to support that, no cost to the designer. Um, so we, we allowed and thought outside the box on this particular project. And what that means is that um, with all of these models, um, whether it's the IFC themselves uh, or when you brought those into federated models, so here's an example of the uh, URL from BIM Collab Zoom and also from Salibri, it doesn't really matter, you could go and federate it in 
other tools like Revisto or you know, Autodesk tools, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but this URL takes you directly to um, Notion, to directly to our information hub to find the specification. And of course, this can support uh, quantification uh, and understanding uh, and other things around uh, the, the specification support. The third part of the brief was around standardization of spaces. So um, we looked really hard about you know, the spatial information that the DFE currently looks at and collects, and they have a particular process which they refer to as the area data sheets, probably more historically referred to as room data sheets. And in IFC terms, I probably rather call them space data sheets because that's actually what they're collecting. So the part of this process was to go through their requirements and document all of this in our database and set out what was required for the project and of course when it's required uh, and the technical information behind that. At the same time, we wanted to use UniClass as the classification system uh, to drive a lot of this. But we, uh, as part of this project, we looked at how UniClass mapped to the current DFE's processes and some of it worked quite well, some of it had some holes and some of it had some questions. So we quickly came to the conclusion for the project that we probably needed to use the DFE's classification um, but we would start a conversation with MBS about how this could be updated and recently MBS um, have been working with the DFE and published uh, updates so that this classification can align uh, fully and be defined um, across projects. Of course we want to make sure that the, uh, the EIR around the spatial information is specific to what the DFE does and not just kind of use generic templates so it's really important that um, EIRs are, are tailored to the client so we, again we look through the, um, the DFE's current processes uh, and put that onto the project and what that's allowed us to do then is take the data um, that's been produced by the model authors and visualize that data so this is the um, the ADS codes or area data sheet codes that the DFE used and you can see down on the left hand side all of the codes but they're actually also colored up as they appear in the schedule of accommodation and you can see here how they appear within the model but you can quite quickly go and select any of these and filter that to, to find information so here you can find out where in the building all the classrooms are uh, and you know that might inform how you develop the design in terms of rationalizing that approach equally you can look at all of the offices together and, and you can look at any of this information and cut and dice it however you want to equally you can use schedules within in this case within Salibri to filter that information and see how many of these particular uh, pieces uh, or spaces in the model you've got and again you can colour those up in three dimensions. What I would say is that as part of this process as information managers we needed to work with the designers to work out processes for delivering this so this is one of the processes around the area data sheet process that we developed and Archicad is you know central to this process but also it's not just architectural information that we're producing here. We need to federate this with uh, the building services MEP design information uh, into here and potentially others as well. So although this process probably looks quite complicated, it's, it's fairly simple in terms of setting it out and describing it. Uh, and I'll show you some of the examples of the outputs that we got from this process. So um, obviously, you know, the information for the project isn't produced by us. It is produced by other people. Our role is to help and support the designers to provide what the DFE wants on this particular project and the architects on this produce their area data sheets directly within Archicad and you can see here the ADS codes, the Uniclass codes and the various other bits of information. But they also created data within their model um, that needed to be filled out by other people so this is linked in the model, this is created as data then exported and effectively as Excel and then brought back into Archicad in order that it can be federated into the IFC file uh, and provided as a single uh, set of deliverables. We don't want architectural spaces and m &E spaces, we only want a set of architectural spaces within the model. What that's allowed us to do is then take this data and put it within uh, the Airtable database and visualise this data as uh, an area data sheet. It's not quite how the DFE does this at the moment, but it's a similar kind of um, representation of what we're doing. Again, because it's an R&D project, we can kind of play around with this a little bit and experiment with this. 
the clever part of this is that the um, information in the kind of peachy orangey color um, is actually the, the client's requirement. So that's actually their, their data library that they currently use uh, against each of these space types. And then the gray fields are the values that the designer is uh, authoring. So this is from a, a little bit earlier in the project, but much of this data has now been completed. But if I just flick through a couple of these slides, you can see how they vary depending on what the, uh, the classification has been assigned to this information. And again, you know, developing a room data sheet or an area data sheet uh, for a project has often been quite complex, but actually creating fairly simple process, thinking about that process, uh, allows us to deliver this at very, very low cost in terms of the, the information. And again, this is just part of our service that we delivered on this. Again, all of this data, both the, the data itself and the, the area data sheet are embedded directly within the information hub. But of course, it's not just about spatial data. It is about other data that supports this. And so there is a much wider process to this. Um, but spaces is kind of um, you know part of the brief and we've gone beyond that and tried to look at other data sheets and some of these are blank on here but have now been um, completed in terms of the project. The, the final aspect if you like of the, the project and probably the main aspect of the project is to deliver a carbon zero school. So early on we understood that um, Mark McDonald wanted to use one click LCA as their tool, it's something they used internally and probably more traditionally I guess directly with Revit. And we needed to look at this process and investigating the process, there was a plugin or a, a series of tools for Celebrity. Unfortunately, it didn't work. So we had to look for other workflows and we found an Excel template that needed to be delivered. So we quickly realized that we needed to produce uh, the set of data consistently from all of these different models. Um, although you could probably do it individually, we wanted to be the, uh, the guardian of the quality of the information that we were producing and doing that in Celebrity to produce an Excel output to ultimately import that into uh, one-click LCA. As part of this process, we had to do a fairly um, a fair amount of complexity in, in making the data work from the various models, not because the models were wrong, but we didn't want to add more requirements into uh, each of the authors and give them lots of work when we could probably solve this centrally. So mapping, for example, IFC entities to the classification system that, or the class as it's called in them, um, uh, one click LCA, we could do that without them necessarily needing to put that information in the model. Equally, we could take information for, from the MBS, so the, there's four pieces of data and uh, effectively concatenate that data in order to give that information uh, over to Mott McDonald to do the carbon assessment. And here again, you can just see how this kind of schedule, and it's not loads of fields in order to do it, most of it is really primarily about quantifying and classifying this information consistently. Um, it wasn't a, an easy process and I wouldn't say we perfected it, but we certainly went a long way to uh, solving solving the workflow with this. And again, this is the, the example of some of the output that we created through this process. This is across all the, the models for both buildings, so 14 models, all using IFC as a workflow to create this consistency. And finally, this information is imported into uh, one click LCA and you can see here, although it looks a bit crazy, um, some of the where the data ends up within the system that allows Mott McDonald to do this carbon assessment. And of course, um, ultimately, you know, the carbon assessment is using the data that was provided from the building information models via the IFC workflow and into Salubri and then back out as Excel uh, to do this assessment of the building uh, and that process is still ongoing uh, the project is due to complete soon uh, and we're just still working through that of course it's not just about uh, carbon uh, we need to understand can we afford this carbon zero school uh, and so quantification has been a big part of the process and working with mcdonald to work out the quantities and some of those quantities that you saw in the carbon process um, will be used also to do the quantification and again all of the models have been used to that and this the models have been used and exported to um, Costex as a tool that's being used to um, provide that um, confirmation that the, the building can be afforded. The final part is design for operations. As I mentioned, the, the operational side was kind of under sustainability originally. Um, similar process, I guess, to the carbon in that the IFC models were brought together in Salibri. Um, we export the, the Kobe file from that model once we've checked all the data and made sure it's right. Uh, we've also checked the Kobe in the Kobe free Kobe QC reporter. Um, but I guess the extra bit we've done on this process is we've then taken this data, copied and pasted this data into the Airtable database. 
Uh, and this is an example of the KV data that we've produced. Um, so on the left hand side, the yellow, orange, sort of purple and green are kind of the typical things that are produced um, as part of a standard KV workflow. Um, the probably the minor difference here is that we've used the area data sheet classification as the primary classification rather than using Uniclass, um, but otherwise it's kind of a similar process. What we've then able to do is that the red fields are actually mapped uh, from data provided in the models. So this adds additional data into this data set that the designer has not had to sit there and manually put in, but provides uh, information that we can use uh, further on. And then on top of that, we've then added additional information, uh, the Uniclass classifications, both the space table and the activities, and then added a series of area data sheet information on top of that. So this is what the data looks like in the, the database, just series of columns, rows and columns, and you know, I've hidden a few fields here, but you know, fundamentally, uh, there's a lot of information about the model. But what we can then do with this data is we can then um, carve it however we want to. So we could look at these spaces by their uniclass codes if we want to do and see which spaces are part of that. Equally, we could take uh, the uh, DFE's area data sheet and carve it and look at it by that. So we can look at this data in, in a number of different ways, or we can look at it by their area guide, uh, guidelines categories. So there's different ways once we've got this information into a database to interrogate and, and look at it and how we can use it. Equally, you can look at this data uh, graphically. Uh, we don't have to just look at it um, in kind of static format and you can interact with these diagrams as well. It's kind of, I guess, almost like a primitive version of Power BI. Uh, and we can take this data and also, like we've done with the um, space data sheets, turn it into um, other data sheets. So this is a data sheet purely about the facility. So this contains the project site and building information. Again, all of this was driven by the EIR. And in this particular case, the EIR looked at information that's typically connect, collected by the DFE uh, through their Get Information School Service website. Um, so we were really trying to replicate that process and collect information during the design and construction process that could be handed over and used um, further down the line by the DFE. So just to conclude and some final thoughts through this process, the project's still ongoing. We've got, um, as of recording this, we've got a few more weeks uh, to, to finish the stage four uh, delivery. So the carbon assessment and the costing and so on is still going on. And there's been a lot of positives in this project. It's been challenging. It's certainly been challenging in terms of bringing models together from different disciplines. And, you know, Archicad has proven its worth in this. And, you know, equally so with the other tools. Um, and, you know, we've really delivered the information that we set out to deliver. I've certainly learned, uh, learned a lot myself, and I think the team has. Uh, and I'd like to think that the Department for Education have learned a lot that they can take on to uh, future development of their information management resources. Of course, you know, the technology's there, the brief, you know, delivering the brief, but we can't do this without the rest of the team. And, you know, I'm grateful to the Department for Education for appointing us initially and for MOTS um, taking us as the information manager for the delivery side. But, you know, the model authors have had to put a lot of work into delivering this and it has been challenging at times. We, we all know it can be challenging to deliver data even uh, on a standard sort of design project, but not one where we're actually also exploring quite a lot of complexity um, in terms of actually developing a design that satisfies the carbon zero brief. So I will conclude there and uh, we can go on to some questions. Now, thanks very much for your presentation, Rob. I, I think the, the, the lack of questions might be because of the number of people that are, uh, what can I say, mind blown. Um, the research and development and the energy and effort that you put into the projects throughout the, you know, throughout the first presentation I saw you do uh, seven years ago in KCC in 2014, it, it always kind of it always kind of blows people's minds the the level of detail that you go to. It must be something about the British and the standards. I don't know. Maybe is it is it? Uh, I don't know. I think it's probably my mind. I think um, you know I'm an architect. I'm an architect by training, but I guess my I'm a very kind of structured person in, in how I think and how I want to put stuff together and understand the detail. So, you know, my focus is on detail rather than um, conceptual stuff. And hopefully people can take a little bit away, um, you know, just little snippets of ideas just to get you thinking. And that's, you know, to me, a presentation shouldn't tell you exactly how to do it. It's more about um, 
uh, giving you a little bit of inspiration, maybe taking some things that you think, well, yeah, I could go and investigate that workflow or maybe think about that. And, and to me, that's what it's about. Um, you know, I, I get personally bored by presentations that are lacking detail, um, but that's just my personality. Other people will enjoy those. So each to their own, I guess. Well, you might not like mine today. I'm, I might, there's not enough time to explain what I'm talking about today, but... Um, <laughs> But in any case, for those that are new to the to um, to the event and seeing uh, our Q and A for the first time, uh, and are a bit confused as to how to participate in the chat, please make sure that you click on the um, to log into the chat. Don't worry, it's only Vimeo protecting us from bots attacking us. Um, they're not trying to <laughs> sign you up or take your credit card details. But if you want to ask Rob some questions, I can see there's some interesting comments already saying that people's minds are blown. Um, that's usually the case whenever you hear Rob speak. But you, you cut your slide numbers down, Rob. You're not you're not going to two slides a minute anymore. <laughs> uh, I think it was, yeah, I got up to four, I think, four <laughs> slides a minute at one point. Um, yeah, which is probably a bit stupid. But uh, look, uh, you know, there is a lot to take in. I, I think. It, there's a lot of detail there, but hopefully people understand the message around yeah. uh, the two things. Fundamentally, that it's about a process, which is ISO 19650 is a process to to follow, and that that would apply, you know, whether you're delivering a house or whether you're delivering a mega project, and and that process can be applied. And we're applying this across, um, you know, all kinds of different uh, project sort of sectors. In fact, we've won a couple of new projects this week that are in sectors we've not worked in, and the process will still apply. Yes, we need to change it and we need to adapt it, and not, you know, schools are different to a prison or different to residential stuff. Um, so, and the other thing is, of course, around open BIM, and and you know, it's an Archicad conference, and you know, obviously, my background is using Archicad, but I, I guess I, as a, in my own mind, have moved beyond that to look at. The wider picture of all of this and how do we as Archicad users interface with not just tools but with the process and with clients to um, make sure that we can deliver that information the data that you know provides information to clients to make better decisions to ultimately get better projects and better buildings out of this process that fundamentally is what we're trying to achieve and Gen Zero is a is an example of what we're doing and in some places we've done more in other places we may have not done you know as much but you if you look at a lot of our projects they're pretty much the same process the data is different the, the, the maybe the outputs are slightly different and some of the the tools that we might use but fundamentally we're trying to deliver really good quality information and i said in, in my presentation information is not just about drawings and data it's about you know reports it's about schedules it's about certificates so you know we've just been working with the dfe on looking at all the certificates they require, you know, post handover. So it, it's a much wider picture and we need to go back to basics in some ways and think about information, not think about what tools do. Yeah, okay, so let's go into some questions before I take off because the problem is is that when you and I catch up, we talk for hours and hours on end um, and we won't go into too many jokes about my wife saying that you're my second wife because of the times that we talk, <laughs> to, to, talk to one another. But, but David's got a question, Rob, for you specifically about metadata um, regarding mm -hmm. um, the, the concept of transmittals when you've got no CDE or um, electronic, electronic document management systems. Um, how, how would you be creating some of that metadata? So really, fundamentally if we take it back and say we haven't got software to support you know outside of Archicad of course we haven't got necessary software to support the exchange of information a lot of this comes down to a project information standard setting out the standard for the information that you want to share whether that's as simple as you know layering in a CAD file uh, or sharing information between Archicad and Revit but fundamentally planning out your information the task information delivery plan in old money is an information release schedule uh, and planning that stuff out of what information you're going to share, when you're going to share it. And then and that comes into what would have, you know, in the historically been drawing issue sheets or transmittal sheets, as they kind of, I guess, more generically known, and, and putting that data within there to communicate it. And you can add this information, you know, the revision or the status of information to a file name. You, you're not forced to use a technology solution. Yes, it helps. And, you know, things like a site Viewpoint, and these other kind of CDE solutions can help. You, if you're rigorous about this process in SharePoint or you know whatever other um, you know Dropbox, dare I say, um, you know ways of, of working, it, it comes down to standardising that process across the team 
and you know, all too often people are using different project codes when it's pretty simple to agree that and, and work with that. So none of this process that we're applying can't be applied even without technology solutions. You know, you can do the EIR in a, in a Word document and a, and a PDF, and we do, you know, have to do that sometimes. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, we're trying to push this agenda on a little bit and think about how we can digitize our own processes, not just digitize the delivery. So um, I noticed there was a question about, you know, Notion and stuff. And what we should mention is that, you know, we're not storing information on Notion. We're not storing files. So we're not storing drawings and and the, the actual asset data. All we're doing is writing down the process. So we're sharing the process and in a, a an online platform, which is password protected. It's been through security uh, approval because we're not actually sharing data um, about the building. The only data we're really sharing is project directory, which fundamentally you could go and find details on LinkedIn or uh, people's websites if you wanted to find out their names, you know, and email addresses. Um, that's probably about the only, you know, contra controversial, it's not even controversial. You know, we're not using DFE, we're not delivering, you know, sharing school information or student information. We're only sharing information about that delivery process. And many government departments, if you go and look at the MOJ historically, have shared their documents online anyway. You can go and search for them and find some of the older stuff. So, you know, that, that delivery process, and we need to share it more, not, not hide it. No, it, it's an interesting point, Rob. A um, few people's minds are blown and, and seeing that it's a, it's it's going to be something for them well on the horizon, which is which is why I like putting your stuff up here to kind of make people realise and see the strategic future within their business and how this will hit them, but it's going to hit them hard if they don't if they don't adapt and and be prepared for it now. But um, uh, Ricard's asking about how you how you um, display your information or how you, how you, how you, how you I guess present it. So, I mean, we were talking about this actually internally about, you know, I, I guess our fundamental thing has been to help drive the process to get better data first. So how do we get better data out of Archicad? How do we get better data out of Revit? Um, we've had some challenges with on the Bentley side and the Vectorwork side, and, you know, we've had to come to a, some compromises a little bit around the edges, but, you know, that that's the nature of delivery, but it's not stopped us delivering that uh, information. And then we've been talking about how do we visualize this stuff. So um, we've been working using Airtable as a way of visualizing the data sheets, for example, and that, that is obviously part of that process. And that's, you know, can we then PDF or, or even just viewed online as a database? So we've been looking at how we can visualize that stuff. And um, if you probably watch um, Rosie's presentation later, she'll so, show you some of the stuff. Pretty sure she'll so, uh, show you things around Power BI that we've been doing internally as a business. And um, you're looking at things like BIM Collab ultimately and how you connect that to, to Power BI or, you know, you could do it with BIM Track, of course, or, or other um, solutions. So, um, yeah, I think visualizing and sharing that data is probably the next big step of what we want to do and improve. But as I said, a lot of this is embedded in the information hub. So you can go and get all of this, even the models, you know, that you can spin around those models in, in Notion uh, and not, never have to leave Notion if you, if you didn't want to. No, I really like that, that how powerful Notion is. Uh, Carl's asked a question. Great presentation. It's up there with Lego BIM, so he still doesn't think it's as good as your Lego BIM stuff, mate. <laughs> I still I must work harder. I still, I still, <laughs> I still won't forget when we were sitting at the top of um, oh, a, a skyscraper in uh, on the Gold Coast, talking about what what you should model in Lego in ArchiCAD back in 2015. <laughs> so it's amazing how time flies, but. Um, he wants to know about how much information you're getting from your clients. So, so working with the Department of Education over in um, in the UK, how how open to this this collaboration process are they in terms of actually documenting their information requirements, or are you having to kind of hold their hand the whole way? Uh, look, all of these come down to the client and, and the individuals within that client. You, you know, you can't just put it down to a single individual, but. I think the what I have learned probably over the last certainly 18 months, two years, is that it's key that there's a person in those organisations who gets it, understands it, and yeah. and wants to go off and find the information for you. As an information manager, it's not my job to tell you what information a client needs. I can help you, and, and we do, of course, and we do have clients who have very little knowledge. And yes, we can come along and say, look, this is probably what we think you should be doing. Um, we've got a project at the moment that's about to start where it, it's a 10 year master plan of little bits of uh, assets 
uh, refurbs, you know, people just going and, uh, and knocking things about. And I, I said, look, you know, maybe we don't need to model this stuff. Maybe it's just about the information, better drawings, better records of your information. Um, with the Department for Education, um, been working with uh, BIM implementation manager, uh, and she's been absolutely fantastic. She is an architect. She understands what we've what we've been dealing with, um, and we've both had to work together. You know, almost speaking weekly, if not daily, uh, and working together to work out what do we need to produce. But it is about her then going and talking to colleagues, us meeting with the colleagues to go through. So, health and safety, um, uh, condition survey, uh, soft landings. Uh, you know, all these different um, aspects, and they've got. You know, obviously, it's a big department different uh, aspects of that department to work out what information do they need not just for the asset management but also during the project so you know what do you want at stage two what do you want at stage three four what do you want in procurement you know when when the contractor um, provides their information then you've got to work through that through that process and um, you know we have been working with the dfe beyond um this project to, to look at further about what they want to do uh, but it's a long process and it's not going to be solved you know what moving towards information management and digitizing information isn't something you just do pay a consultant and and, and that's it you it's a long-term commitment that the client has to buy into uh, and some clients already have it they're already doing it and they probably don't realize and the dfe was one they do have lots of information requirements and that's why the project was able to do what it it was able to do we only had 10 days on the project to put together the requirements so we didn't have a lot so we did have to take a, a pretty good you know view of it but since then we've been working with them to understand you know what we would do differently uh, you know going forwards now brian spears mate fanboy brian spears uh yeah. he uh he said he's he's very excited to uh set his alarm in the middle of the night to get up to watch your presentation well done open bin brothers so well, i'm sad i forgot to wear i should have changed my shirt to to uh, match our open brim brothers um from a few years ago but i haven't done it uh brian you almost win the award for the most intensive along with francois from uh, south africa getting up nice and early um catherine question from one of our other speakers catherine um putting in the point that it's great to see an architect uh, managing the process it's a little known trait that we have to be extremely organized and structured in our work not just to be artistic so true and uh and, and it's my belief that the profession should take this role on because we're very good at managing projects as it is or some of us are some of us aren't <laughs> um, well yeah and i would i would i would say nathan you know historically and i know you're probably an advocate of not this but you know historically architects have lost power in the, yeah, yep. the project man yeah. project project managers have come to the fore and taken a lot of what uh, we as architects originally had you know as a as a profession and and to some degree this is not just about architects anyone can take this process back and or take on this process and for us it's about an architectural business understanding that there is you know this ability to take some of that skill that we know as architects and project delivery and information delivery uh, and increasing our service accordingly um, but it's not just about making money it's ultimately about helping our own architectural yeah. practice as well uh, deliver more efficiently and effectively and making happier clients yeah I, I, yeah the, the thing is is because my upbringing in architectural practice has been about a full service architect so i've learned how to manage projects properly um, whereas other architects have let that go and hence lost to project managers and they'll do the same thing with bim there's an opportunity here for us to do that but but that's the case mm -hmm. matthew talks about the uk being more advanced than other locations which is a, a known fact um how have you found private site, private sector clients adapting to this um, to information requirements? Are there many private clients in the UK asking for projects to be delivered in accordance with ISO 19650? I think the simple answer is that there, there's a mixture and a blend. Obviously, government um, departments from 2016 were required to do it. Um, that wasn't necessarily a good thing because some of them needed to do it. And maybe back then there was a little bit of um, I dare I say box ticking to to make sure they've done it. I think private clients are a little bit more. Well, actually, this is what I need. Um, they're less driven by the not by the process. I say nineteen six fifty as a process is still yeah. applicable, but their data approaches might not be. You know, might be more bespoke. So rather than simply requiring a Kobe output, which is part of the UK BIM framework, and you know, I should say the UK BIM framework is key in the UK to 
to driving a lot of what's going on in the UK. So I've been contributing to, uh, and my colleague Emma as well, to the guidance that's being produced in the UK. So the, the 19650 series is great and it, it's international. And obviously we've got a UK annex, but the guidance is critical to pushing this on and it's free and, it, and it's publicly available and you can go and, and get it. And, and private clients are taking that and saying, right, I should be following this process. If this is best practice, this is what the industry is saying, then let's adopt it. So, you know, we have clients on, uh, both government departments and I would say government work is you know is a is a significant m- amount but we just won a, a residential project this week that you know is is not a government project okay you could argue it's sort of loosely linked um but they're willing you know they want to do this and you know at the end of the day do you want to improve the information you have in your organization to make better decisions that that's not just a government department thing that's a that's a business decision yeah. um, and you know we've got to tell clients that I'm not going to say on the flip side, it's still a struggle to to justify what information management is about and that there is a fee associated with organizing and delivering your information. But at the end of the day, when people start to realize the value of what that information can do, uh, you know, we're all so used to having stuff at our fingertips, you know, I can turn the heating on for my phone. Um, you know, that's what we're aiming for across all of these assets to be able to, you know, know when my boiler needs fixing or give me an alert and say, you know, in three months time, I'm going to have to go and pay for a new boiler or whatever it might be. You know, that's the kind of level that we're getting to. And obviously there's things in the UK, the national digital twin um, and other things that are coming out, the golden thread of everything that came out of Grenfell and fire. Um, So there's a lot more going on in the UK in terms of how we're developing and private clients, um, you know, will, will need to do this because it will become part of legislation as we move forward as well. Yeah, Cornelius wants to know whether the creative process can be digitised. <laughs> let's not open that. Let's not open that can of worms today. Um, there are there are some some great tools that are out there that can assist, not probably take over the role of an architect. Uh, Brent's comments, my favourite, Rob. Um, mm-hmm. Like listening to God of information management. So basically, you know, it's kind of in, it's kind of interesting that we're actually working in a, on an online environment today. It's like as if you're speaking from the clouds. Um, impressive to see the linking of various software platforms. Great open BIM processes. Um, we, we I mean, what I would say, I would, I would say, it, um, probably something I didn't say in the presentation is that. Um, this whole project for the last 13 months i've never met the client i've never met the design team it's all um, right. i've never met the i've never met the project manager um you know we've we've basically done this using all the stuff that i've shown the technology plus you know teams and uh, and various other bits and pieces um and you know we've proved that and actually all my fee proposals now assume that most of it we won't actually have physical means so you know i could deliver a project in australia okay the time zone might be a, a bit of a challenge but actually it would be no different i could, you know okay i probably need an english speaking language but other than that we're not we're not limited by um you know the physical boundaries or the physical locations of of people and you know we've been even discussing it internally that we could have people uh, anywhere to deliver what we do because it's not you know this process is about openness in both technology terms but also in people terms well it's amazing how covid i, I was i was speaking to someone a couple of months ago and they had a team member that had to move into state uh because their partner had to go to a different university to study or something and they said, well, we're letting him remote. He's going to work remotely from this other state now. He said, but he said, but pre-COVID, I would have never been open to that scenario whatsoever. But COVID means that everyone's realising that this type of stuff is actually possible now to the, the whole need to be sitting next to each other delivering these things is not necessary. Um, and, and I would say, and I would say, Nathan, it's accelerated what we're doing. I think people have realised that they can't use traditional processes in a lot of this, and yeah. that, you know, sharing information more instantly and, and online, and obviously with some people with rubbish internet connections, having you know ways of doing that without you know. Uh, stopping you doing your work is critical uh, and you know we've had that challenge in the business about Archicad and how we get everyone working remotely and uh, you know most people have managed to do that our IT team were fantastic in doing that but you know we just had it's accelerating what would have happened over a, you know uh, probably over a longer period um, and I think everybody has had to do it and therefore you know there's, there was no going back and I don't think things would change some things would change you know we will go into the office a bit more but fundamentally we will work more remotely than we ever have done you know in the long term. Yeah. And there's an interesting comment here from, from Sam, I guess, in regards to um, contracts. Um, mm-hmm. So in terms of contract that, that the builders are signing up against, do you want to talk about the fact that of contracts not really needing to be adjusted too much? There's obviously the, 
the um, the, sta the standards that you have to obviously apply and the and the and the, and the mapping of naming and terminology. I think look, in terms of contracts, the critical part of ISO 19650 process, which everyone fails, and this project is one of the few where we've done it, is the information was described and set out before the team were appointed and it was part of the tender process. So all of the designers who were ultimately appointed under Mark McDonald had all of the information requirements. Now, because it's an R&D project, there was always going to be a, you know, we might need to vary and we wrote some of that in. We've only added one piece of data, which was the MBS URL. That was the URL was something that I, you know, looking back, I probably should have thought to put in. But one piece of data out of I don't know how many pieces of data we've specified is not is not bad going. And we've taken a few other bits out, you know, as a compromise. So um, it was in their contract. It's in part of their appointments. Again, ISO 19650 is it should be in their appointments, and that that is a critical part. The information protocol is a critical part of that. So we don't need to change contract models, although. I'm sure my colleague uh, Emma could talk for a long time about, you know, integrated project insurance and, yeah. and contracts and, and how it can change. What I'm saying is you don't have to change it to do a lot of this. Um, just to answer the bit on business case as well, you know, we're talking about a government department here um, who have to do it. There's the um, construction playbook, which came out recently, which basically tells them they've got to do ISO 19650. Um, for private clients, you don't have to do this, but there is a business case there. And obviously that's part of us to help if people want, want some help on, you know, justifying what, what this is going to provide in value. Yeah. Well, Rob, we've run out of time, mate, and we could talk for hours. No, that's cool. and, and I know yeah, how much it would be fun to keep going on and on. But um, thank you very much once again for contributing and sharing your knowledge on this. Um, and if people want to ask Rob further questions, just put them into the chat and Rob can answer um, you uh, now. Yeah. Um, anyway, thank you a lot. Thanks a lot, Rob. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks for the opportunity to present. Now we're going to go move straight on to the next session. We've run out of time, so we know ad break. Um, so we're going to go straight on to the next session. So um, see you in a second, guys.